Uh, frustratingly, this Kia Stinger doesn't want to let me do any kind of sideways action without the stability control kicking in, even though it's turned off. <laughs> Kia's rear drive stinger was born to play in a market like ours. On paper, this perception altering Gran Turismo sedan has all its ducks in a row. A purest drivetrain layout with an all turbo engine lineup and strikingly muscular styling with sufficient space to carry four adults. But the flip side of testing the first pre production stinger we could get our hands on is an ESC system that won't quit, and worse, adaptive dampers fixed to the hardest possible setting enough to make our in-car camera vision blurrier than a night on absinthe. The stinger that everybody wants to know about is this top spec GT. About 60 grand when it goes on sale in September and filled with the works. Brembo brakes, 19s, adaptive suspension, twin turbo V6, rear wheel drive, but to be the first people in the country to drive it, we need to test this pre-production car. And while it has a whole bunch of electronic issues, some really crap pre-production plastics. It has all the bits that count. The right tyres, the right adaptive suspension, the right steering tune, and the performance. That's what we're here for. This car, with the sports exhaust, that'll be optional. We want to see what it can do. So, while this being a pre-production car with 7,800 Ks on the clock means that it's beautifully run in, nice and fresh, perfectly primed for performance numbers, it also has pre-production electronics, which means that even when you turn the traction and the ESC off, you can't wind it up on the brake. Apparently the production car will let you do that for the first six seconds, meaning you can take it up to like 4,000, get a little bit of slip off the line, and really give it that extra kick, you know. Here, we've, at best, we've got just under 2,000, quickly step off the brake, and it's quick, as we're about to see. 6 grand in first, 6.5 in second, almost 6.5 in third. Sport mode dampers, 6.4 in fourth, 200, just 210. Brake so I don't go into the bloody kit editor and die. So 5.1 to 100 and a 13.2 quarter, a pretty bloody impressive out of this V6. What it can't do is that it can't drift without the ESC kicking in. So much as we want some smoke and some drift for the video, this pre-pro car, regardless of what we got, just won't let us do it. So considering we can't strip the tread off the tyres, we thrust the Stinger GT into the real world. Now, part of this car's pre-productionness is that we have the bimodal exhaust switched on permanently. Normally, it would only work under 50% throttle um, or in the sportier modes, and you can actually customise it in a custom mode, but here, we've got everything all of the time, which means that there's quite a lot of drying when you're driving around. But that said, when it's on song, it's actually quite fruity and raspy, and it's so much nicer than the pre-production car I drove in Korea last year, which had no exhaust note at all, and uh, just a kind of a, a SUV-like gradiness, which totally doesn't suit the Gran Turismo rear drive sporty sedan that this car's trying to be. Dynamically, the Stinger has been tuned exclusively for Australia. Obviously, there's already a European tune, done at the Nürburgring, but the Aussie team have been able to do their own sway bars, their own spring and damper tune. And there's two very different flavours. Obviously the 2 liter is much more comfort oriented. The V6 on adaptive suspension, and these are the only two cars we've driven so far, is much, much firmer. In sport mode, the Stinger GT is really firm ride-wise. I would suggest that it was probably set up for a track and is probably best suited only for a track in Australia. The auto mode in this car is called Smart, and Smart uses the parameters of both comfort and sport and decides for itself, and that's probably the smartest thing to do. There's something really great about the speed and accuracy of this car's steering. It only has 2.2 turns lock to lock. It's two and a half in the two litre. And the steering is really quick. You could have it in auto or comfort, smart I should say, 
an inch straight ahead and it does feel a little bit uh, I suppose not disconnected but sort of disinterested but then as soon as you start adding knocking you realize that the turn in this car is really terrific it's really tight and turns in except on probably really tight corners we do notice that the V6 does weigh 1750 kilos and that there is uh, a slightly fat assed older generation V6 sitting up front. Now the other headline feature about this car is obviously its performance. 3.3 litre V6 with two turbochargers, 272 kilowatts, 510 newton metres starting at 1300 RPM. Now that says that it should have grunt directly off the line. Even though the throttle calibration on this car and really light traffic is quite on off, it's, it probably needs a little bit of finessing. However, once you're into it, and when you're really driving it, the performance of this car is, is immense. It has this lovely, raspy V6 exhaust flare, a really strong and thick mid-range, and, you know, 5.1 seconds to 100 is not hanging about. That is almost as fast as the 4.9 we got out of the last SSV Redline Automatic we tested. So, besides the fact that it's two cylinders short of a V8, it has all the performance of any performance Holden Badge Commodore. Everything in this car actually fits together really well. Some of the European guys criticised it for being too conservative and I suppose in some of the displays and certainly with the, the nav map thing that we're looking at here, it's nowhere near as classy as the Google Maps one on Apple CarPlay, which it also has. Uh, I think there's class to it. It's like the uh, eyeball air vents from a Mercedes but somehow done better. Uh, all the switch gear is really nice. These little toggle controls here for the heating and seat cooling are, are really smart and neat and clever. Um, I love the floating door armrests. Uh, and there is enough room to seat four people comfortably, even though the styling of this car is clearly coupe-esque. This is not a rear drive taxi. This is a proper sportily styled sedan. The Stinger isn't perfect, especially with the pre-production GT's adaptive dampers stuck on bone jarring. But as a swift and suave range topper, or even as an entry level rear drive alternative to a bunch of mundane front drivers, Kia's entertaining flagship brings enough individuality and quality to demand the attention of any badge snobs out there. And let's not forget the uncanny timing of this rear drive flag waver landing on Aussie soil. The fact that the Stinger will hit Kia showrooms just before holding up stumps on the rear wheel drive Commodore is orchestrated perfection. Like right now we're in comfort mode and even on the jiggly back roads that we just drove on a minute ago, thank you collision alert, which is also not a, a, an exciting feature of this pre-production car and then it goes off all the time.